a broader perspective now. Richard Haydarian is a scholar and policy advisor and a widely published writer. His most recent book is called Duterte, A Populist Revolt Against Elite Democracy. We reached him in Perth, Australia. First, help me understand why Duterte is so popular. Well, first of all, we have to put that within historical context. Almost all Filipino presidents uh, in recent surveys, with the exception of President Arroyo, uh, who won a very controversial uh, election back in 2004, have had relatively high approval ratings. Uh, so we, I mean, they say in tropical countries, we have long honeymoons. Uh, the same thing applies to our politics. So actually, if you look at numbers of the territory right now, they're not too far from the numbers that former presidents Ramos and the two Aquinas had in the past 30 years. That's one thing. On the other hand, I think uh, President Duterte is also appreciated by the public for his decisiveness. There is this kind of cult of action uh, in Philippine political culture, whereby sometimes people are not really looking at the results or outcomes of what presidents or leaders do. They more look at the decisiveness or willingness of a leader to actually deal with a specific problem. And I think lastly, uh, President Duterte also taps into this new zeitgeist of autocratic nostalgia. If you look at Pew Research Survey, if you look at World's Value Survey, a majority of Filipinos are now looking for a strongman leader uh, who will deal with complex problems in the society. They feel that the democratic institutions are incapable of doing that, and Duterte very effectively appeals to that kind of yearning for a strong, decisive single-minded leaders. You've described him as a, a man of the masses, and you talk about that sort of single-mindedness that he has. You also say he's, in effect, trying to create what I think what you described as an imperial presidency. Is there any contradiction in those two ideas? Well, actually, I describe President Duterte as a hybrid populist. Of course, he's increasingly more right-wing because he emphasizes law and order rather than left wing when he of course when he was still new in power he brought in some former communist leaders tried to push for social justice and progressive reform but now he's more on the law and order area he's more on the concentration of power area but he's really hybrid in a sense that he appeals to different sections of society for different reasons uh, the masses like him precisely because you know he presents himself as some sort of a outside the box candidate as someone who doesn't belong to the imperial manila elite you know of course he has his own political dynasty in davao but he's not part of the mainstream elite of the philippines uh, at least those in metro manila but his actually greatest appeal is among the aspirational and upper middle classes in the philippines and that's where penal populism comes into picture whereby what duterte says is that well maybe there could be some extrajudicial uh, measures here. Maybe we may have to work around certain democratic institutions or circumvent them. Uh, but guess what? I'm protecting you, the law-abiding citizens. I'm protecting you, the property people, against thieves and rapists and criminals and drug dwellers, which, of course, in the case of the Philippines, tend to mostly come from lower rungs of the society. We've talked uh, often about sort of the, the rise of populism in places like East, in places like Europe and even in the United States. Is there a difference in the populism that you see in Southeast Asia that you describe Duterte as being at the heart of? The factors that led to rise of populism like Donald Trump or Marie Le Pen uh, in Europe are quite different from that in emerging market democracies. If you look at the Philippines, India, Turkey, uh, and increasingly in Indonesia, these are rapidly growing economies. This is not the West whereby you have uh, declining manufacturing, you have people being displaced due to globalization. In fact, the Philippines, Turkey, India, these are countries that have been benefiting from globalization. Yet what we see here uh, is that as the economy has grown fast, the aspirations of people actually have overrun the capacity of state institutions, democratic institutions, to respond right in time. We know democracies tend to be slower tend to be more gradualist, but because of the rapid growth in the economy, actually, people's aspiration has been rising exponentially. So the gap between exponential increase in uh, expectations of people on one hand and the slow, gradual, arithmetic increase in democratic institutions' ability to respond to these new needs, that gap has been very effectively exploited by these uh, strongman leaders, whether it's Modi, Ardoan, or Duterte. And 
And if you look at these leaders, most of them were local government officials in the past who did pretty well. And what they're saying is that they're going to bring their local model, whether it's Gujarat model in, uh, in case of Modi or Davao model in case of Duterte, saying we'll bring it at a national level. And who cares about democracy? Democracy is slow. It's inefficient. Forget about human rights. What we're going to do here is provide basic public services. What are the broader implications of all of this then, particularly given that Southeast Asia is so strategically important, important particularly from a security point of view to the United States and Canada and other Western nations as well? Are there implications in this kind of uh, populist, in fact, brutal populist approach that, that, that could affect those relationships? Well, a number of them. I mean, first of all, remember, the Philippines has been a bastion of democracy and human rights in South Asia and beyond. Uh, for decades, we have been inspiring other countries to make uh, democratic reforms. We have been fighting for human rights. So now suddenly you have the Philippines actually as a harbinger or actually at the cutting edge of a laboratory of 21st century authoritarianism. Uh, this is what we see in the case of the Philippines, for instance. And when the Philippines was the chairman of the Association of South Asian Nations, uh, President Duterte, in a way, actually promoted his own way of approaching problems like drugs and criminality and terrorism. So there was a Duterte effect across the region. More broadly, there's a geopolitical impact because what President Duterte is doing, in my opinion, is bringing back that old debate on Asian values. He's saying that uh, human rights, democracy, these are imposed values from the West that are not universal. He has been openly attacking the West for its supposed hypocrisy. Uh, and that has actually encouraged autocrats across the region to say, well, if the Philippines can do that, an ally of the United States, a former bastion of human rights, then we can do that. And more broadly, of course, this is also, in a way, uh, helping China, you know? So uh, Duterte's disagreement with the West has actually pushed him uh, towards China. And China is one of the countries that has now become one of the key allies of the Philippines. So in the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, potentially in the Human United Nations Security Council, if things get ugly for Duterte in the International Criminal Court, China is coming to the rescue of the Philippines. And very interestingly, China keeps on talking about the Philippines' sovereignty and the necessity to respect Philippine sovereignty, when in fact China has been violating the Philippine sovereignty uh, in the South China Sea. In fact, uh, it's China who has been violating international law by ignoring our arbitration ruling that benefited uh, the Philippines. And now, of course, Duterte, in exchange for China's support on human rights and democracy issues uh, against the pushback from the West, seems to be also compromising uh, in terms of the Philippine stance in the South China Sea. And that's also like um, encouraging China to also expand its footprint in the area. Just the other day, the ruling uh, part in the Philippines, PDP Laban, where Duterte comes from, uh, ha had a celebration whereby they were next to, uh, next to Chinese officials. So you have the Communist Party of China right now having some sort of an alliance with the ruling uh, part of the Philippines, which is extremely mind boggling. Uh, despite all the roller coaster we have been going through since the third coming to power. And we don't know where this is going, but the signs are not very good for Philippine democracy. Richard Hagarian, thank you very much for your insight on all of this and putting it into uh, context. My pleasure.